Hey everyone, welcome to the show. I have John Gordano here today with me. He's got a plethora of stories to tell, but I wanted to introduce him briefly. He is an expert in the treatment of addiction, mental health, and the founder of the National Institute for Holistic Addiction Studies. He is the author of Proven Holistic Treatment for Addiction and Chronic Relapse, How to Beat Your Addictions and Live a Quality Life. And his most recent book is the acclaimed The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up. And he's also the co-author of Molecular Neurobiology of Addiction Recovery, the 12 Steps Program and Fellowship. Over 20 years ago, Gordano founded the prestigious G&G Holistic Addiction Treatment Center in North Miami Beach, Florida, which is an accredited addiction treatment facility. So I'm so glad to meet you, John, and you agreed to be on the show. You're from the South Bronx, so we could probably just talk about the craziness of that. But uh, <laughs> if you want to add to anything I described, go right ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a recovering addict. I'm coming up on 38 years in recovery. I also am a researcher, a clinician. Uh, I'm in approximately 79 medical scientific peer-reviewed journals. I lecture all over the world on addiction and mental health. And um, my latest book, The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up, I wrote it to help motivate people and show them that no, what, no matter what happens in their life, they can be successful. I started my treatment center with $300. And I sold it in 2012 for 45 million. So I never believed in a million years that would happen, but it happened. Um, I'm gonna give you my background and my story, all right? But before I do, I, I wanna read something that I wrote in the back of the book. And this is for your audience. Okay, the kid from the South Bronx who never gave up. Here is my roadmap for positive change. There is one thing in this world, one special lesson, one constant that has guided me through the turbulent waters of life. This infinite rule, which most people know, but ignore, or who simply do not follow their life lessons. That is, no matter what, no matter the circumstances, the obstacles, the people that get in our way, or things that slow us down, follow this one simple rule. Never give up on your dreams, never let go of your passions, and especially never give up on yourself or a God of your understanding. I was blessed to become extremely successful, and I like to share my story with you. This is how my life was transformed and how I was saved from falling into the abyss of hell and by following this one rule and learning how to live life on life's terms and how to have a life worth living. So I will start off with, I'm a kid from the South Bronx, which we already went over. My family was like a mafia type family. My father was a heroin dealer. My uncle was a hitman. My other family members were, let's put it this way, doing other nefarious things. <laughs> wow, what a legacy right there. <laughs> I only went to the ninth grade. Uh, when I was eight, my father went to jail till I was 12. Eight and a half, I got molested by some kids in the neighborhood, some boys. And then when I was nine, I got molested by my babysitter when she was 14. Um, I got into gangs. Uh, I did all kinds of different things. And finally, I wind up uh, getting into karate. I, I'm not going to go in how I did everything else. If you want, read the book. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I got into karate, which really changed my life. I became the grandmaster of the martial arts. I'm a national karate champion. I'm in a couple of black belt halls of fame, um, all that kind of stuff also. Now, during the time that I was growing up, so I was 17 and a half when I went to Florida. And what wound up happening was I met a girl and, you know, anyway, I started doing drugs. I started with LSD. Uh, some guy, I, I never did drugs before or drank when I was growing up. 
I didn't like a drinking, made me throw up, you know, and I didn't like pot and I didn't like anything. And I was always training, so I didn't bother with any of that. And anyway, I heard about LSD. A guy came up to my apartment, one of my neighbors, and he had this little vial. And I said, what's that? He said, well, that's LSD. I said, oh, yeah, I heard about that. Let me see that. I took it, unscrewed the cap, and I drank the whole thing. He freaked out because that was for five people, not for one. Mm -hmm. And I went on a journey for four days, flying everywhere. And it was an interesting journey. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I didn't like it, but I liked it. I started doing every plant medicine known to man, from mushrooms to peyote to psilocybin to mescaline, everything. Anyway, went out of that phase and uh, wind up doing smoking pot, doing pills, doing coke. I didn't like heroin. It made me sick, so I didn't even bother with it. And um, I did all, the, all those different things, but everything started off slowly. It, it was, first, it was all about having fun. And then it changed. And it changed years later. And at the, in the 60s, everybody was doing drugs. You know, uh, free love, there was orgies, there was all kinds of crazy stuff back then. Uh, it was a different time than, it, than today, actually. And um, so I did a lot of different things, even though I was using occasionally on the weekends, you know, with my friends. And um, I did plays in the theater, performing arts. I did kabuki theater plays as Japanese theater. But I, what I did is I wove karate demonstrations into a storyline. <clears throat> and we had people uh, cutting cucumbers off of people's stomach, blindfolded with a live samurai, breaking concrete on fire with your head, um, all kinds of different demonstrations, but woven into a storyline. I did that for about eight years. We had standing room only. <clears throat> I also did, um, I did a lot of stuff, even though I was using. I threw a concert with James Brown. We had 60,000 people show up. I worked for a company called Flea Market USA. And um, it was in Liberty City in Overtown. Man, and that was in the black community. And uh, there was the riots there and it just ended and nobody wanted to go into the city anymore. And um, so the guys that owned the flea market asked me to do something a little different, which I did. I had James Brown come. and. Um, but what I also did is I went to all the deacons, I went to all the churches, and I'm dancing in the churches and doing everything. And I, I got the SBA people, the Small Business Association, to help the people that were getting uh, boots in the flea market, how to run their business, how to buy wholesale, things like that. Then I had an idea. I wanted to invite President Reagan to the flea market grand opening. Everybody laughed at me. So I says, okay. So I sent a letter to the White House. Well, two weeks later, I got a letter back. It's in the book, by the way, so you don't have to believe me. You can see the letter. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they said, sorry, the president couldn't come due to scheduling, but was sending a representative, and they sent Carrie Meeks. Carrie Meeks at the time was a state representative who later on became Senator Meeks. She went around everywhere checking me out because, you know, they don't just come anywhere. And they found out all the things I was doing in the community. They went to the Martin Luther King Foundation and they presented me with the Martin Luther King Award on stage in front of 60,000 people. Now, if you get the book, you can look at the pictures, you'll see all the people. You know, when you tell people these things, they go, yeah, you know, well, I know how people are because I'm an addict, I know how addicts are. They don't believe anybody or anything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, those are some of the things I did. Uh, I did a lot of different things. Uh, one time I went up, I mean, I was just totally crazy. I went up in a hot air balloon. Uh, I told them that I wanted to go up in a hot air balloon dressed as Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer, and the balloonist was Santa Claus. And I wanted to throw flyers out over the city. So everybody, they said, John, you can't do that. We're going to get you know, fined for litter. I said, no, I don't think you understand. I want to throw your money out over the city. They said, what? I said, yeah. What I did was I made a sticker and I turned the dollar bills into a flyer. 
and I threw the money out over the city. We were on every radio station, every television station. We went up four times, and it was the wildest. It was like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of free publicity. And what happened in the fourth time, <clears throat> the wind came, we had a crosswind, and it was taking us out to sea. <clears throat> and I says, I'm not going out to sea. So there was a building there, and I told the guy, because I had this big helmet on that had this headset on with the, the reindeer head. I says, go towards that window, we'll dive in the window in a building. He says, are you crazy? I said, well, I'm not going out to sea. So he says, no, no, I'll, I'll run along the bay. And he hit the seawall and we dragged us into a fire station. And I'm, I have a little light on my nose, you know, Rudolph, and I'm blinking my, my nose. The fire guys came out. They were hysterical laughing, falling down, trying to put their pants on. <laughs> it was a riot. <laughs> so, I mean, if you want to hear funny stories, I can tell you a ton of them. Uh, <laughs> So what wound up happening was, you know, I started getting more and more crazy with the drugs and my family did an intervention on me and I told you who my family was. Yeah. I'm saying, Who's doing an intervention on them? Yeah. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I said, look, my mother said she'll never talk to me again. So I said, okay, I'll go to treatment. I got them off my back. I had a little Coke in my sock. I went to the bathroom, got a couple of hits and then went upstairs. And anyway, what happened to me in treatment, I didn't want to be there. I always had my luggage packed. You know, I said to the people in the group, I wouldn't even get high with you people. What am I doing here? You know, and besides, I was afraid because I wore dark sunglasses. I figured nobody would recognize me, which was stupid. Because I used to teach the nurses and the doctors kids. So anyway, that got dispelled real quick. And uh, <clears throat> one day, I went in during, uh, during uh, December. December 4th is my, what we call our Queen Day. Anyway, it was coming up on Christmas Eve and I wanted to go home with the kids, I said. So I said, no, you can't. And I got crazy. I don't know to get angry, I got rageful. I ran into the room, punched the door. I really didn't want to go home with the kids. My friends would come and give me Coke and Christmas cards so I could go get high. But anyway, I remember my therapist saying to me, John, you ever get on your knees and pray? I said, look, man, I said, I got calluses on my knees. I'm a recovering Catholic. Are you kidding me? So he said, no, 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 for humility. I said, what do you mean? God doesn't listen to me? How about if I'm in the closet? You know, would he hear me? You know, it was real nasty because I was angry at myself. I was full of shame. I was full of guilt. I started to clear up. I started to realize how I hurt myself and everybody else. So anyway, for the first time, I went to get down on my knees and I couldn't get my knee down. And I know that sounds a little strange, but it was true. And I had to push my knee down. Then I pushed my other knee down. And I said, whatever that is out there, God, energy, please take this pain away. And it vanished like it never was there. And I went, this is weird. So I tried to get it back. Well, it didn't come back. So here I am. That was my spiritual awakening, awakening and treatment. That was one of them. There was another one. And eventually, I went to therapy. I went to aftercare. I did every, went to meetings every day. And I was married at the time with two kids. And my wife uh, was an ex-Playboy bunny. And she was doing drugs too and drinking. And here I am, now I'm clean and I'm home. And it wasn't any good. And I, I, they said, don't make any major decisions, which I didn't for a year. Well, actually it was for nine months. And I couldn't take it anymore. So when I got out of treatment, my wife picked me up. She hands me a vial of Coke and says, hey, just do one hit. I said, are you out of your mind? I just spent six weeks in treatment. So I kept going to therapy and I told the therapist, look, I can't do this anymore. So I got divorced. I wound up being homeless because she got the house, she got the car. I just didn't care. She didn't have everything. A friend of mine left me a room and that's where I stayed. A friend of mine left me a bicycle. I had a jar. I used to put quarters in when I had quarters. Uh, 
long story short, a whole bunch of things happened. I went up going back to school uh, to get my GED. And I opened up a treatment center. Then the way I opened it up, I had no money, I had zero, was my friend that owned the hotel that allowed me to stay in one of the rooms. I told him a lie. I said, I know this doctor who was a famous doctor, who was my doctor actually, in treatment wants to open up a treatment center. He didn't even know what I was talking about, the doctor. So he says, how much do you need, my friend said. Now, what do I know? I went to treatment. What the hell do I know about what it costs to run a treatment center? It's a quarter of a million dollars. So he says, you got it. If you can get that doctor, I'll give it to you. Well, I went into the doctor's office. I told him I had a quarter of a million dollars. Would you like to open up a treatment center? And he said, you know, I was just thinking about that. He was a comedian. Mm -hmm. so." We wind up opening it, but it didn't work out with me. I hired my therapist and it wound up not being good because I'm a street kid. I never had a lawyer. I didn't have any paperwork. And long story short, I got cheated out of the treatment center. But I had to stay there in the whole story, in the book, and tell you what happened, how it happened, what I did, uh, because I went to college to get 300 hours of addiction training. Right after I got my GED, then I had to uh, get 6,000 hours of supervised training on the job. So where am I going to go? So I had to stay there. Mm -hmm. And um, it was terrible. But I just said, the hell with it. You know, I had, a, I had a, a, a purpose that I wanted to get. My CAP was a certified addiction professional. And I just shut my mouth and I kept going. And a lot of other things happened during that time. And I wind up um, getting my CAP. I wind up walking in the office and I threatened the therapist who took my place away from me underneath my feet. And um, I told him I rearranged his face and no one's going to fix it. I told him about my uncle who's going to come and blow his knees off, who was the hit guy I was telling you about. And he knew who my uncle was because we put him in treatment because my uncle had a crack cocaine habit. And he was telling everybody all the people he killed. And I said, oh. So what wound up happening was they gave me a contract three months later, I left with $80,000. They made millions of dollars, but I didn't care. Then my same friend said, I have another guy that wants a treatment center. And he says, the guy wants a business plan. I says, I don't know how to make a business plan. He says, I'll make it for you. So he made me a business plan. Two minutes before I was supposed to meet the guy in West Palm Beach, I forgot the business plan. Now, what am I going to do? I can't go backwards. I got to go forward. So I tell the guy, look, my mistake. I forgot it. I thought I had it with me. He says, I don't care. Throws a napkin at me and he says, here, write down what you need the money for. So I did. See, previously, I learned everything about the business while I was working there for all those years. Mm -hmm. And anyway, we opened up that treatment center. I didn't know he was a corporate raider. A year later, he took the treatment center out front, right from under me again, I lost it. So it was pretty crazy. So here I am. I worked at this place called The Better Way, which was an indigent facility, 55 bed with clients that were HIV and they had mental health issues and substance abuse. And I was the clinical director there. It was an old TC, therapeutic community. You know, their style was not my style. They put a guy in the middle of the room. They, they tear him down and then they build him back up. Uh, then they used to feed them cakes and chocolates and stuff at lunchtime. The clients used to act out after the sugar rush. And then we used to put a sign around their neck and sit them on a bench. So none of this made sense to me. And eventually I left. And this girl I was with asked me to uh, open up a treatment center. I said, I'm not opening up anything. So first of all, I had a spending addiction. All I have is $300. So my friend owned the building. And I says, all right, uh, how much is the rent there? He said, well, how much you have? I said, I got $300. He says, tell you what, open it up for about two or three months, get some money in there and give me 300 a month. It was a 750 square foot building. So I invited my friend that I used to work with, this guy, Jerry Goldfarb, uh, to come in. I said, look, I'll give you half the, half the business. So he said, well, let me see your books. 
says, well, I don't have any books. He said, well, how do you know who pays you? I said, I put it in my pocket, they'll pay. So he said, are you crazy? They're addicts, they ain't gonna pay. So he took over the business part. We had people chases us for money, but we still gave people free treatment that we felt they really deserved it. And that went on for a few years. And then his son came in, Gerald, and Gerald was a genius when it came to the internet. I was the guy that did the designing of the program, the marketing. And the program was, I said, there's something missing in treatment. There's only a five to 8% recovery rate. We're not looking at people comprehensively or holistically. So what I wind up doing was I designed the program where we used to give them vitamin therapy. We gave them hyperbaric medicine, which is oxygen under pressure to heal the brain. We helped them with their gut, their microbiome, okay, which is now today they learned it's the second brain. That's what dopamine and serotonin is manufactured. I'd look for other co-contributing factors to addiction and mental health. And such as leaky gut syndrome, H. pylori infection, hypoglycemia, low testosterone, high testosterone, all these things cause depression and anxiety. It's not just psychological. Closed head injuries causes also behavioral problems. Heavy metal toxicity causes interruption in neurotransmission. So it mimics bipolar disorder and attention deficit disorder. So as you can see, there are a number of medical conditions that can cause depression and anxiety that we as treatment providers are not looking at. Well, that's what I was looking at. And we wind up doing neurofeedback, biofeedback. We did sound therapy, light therapy, acupuncture, vitamin amino acid therapy. We, we, we uh, chelated out heavy metals from people. And everybody was laughing at us. It's, ah, oh, go to Giordano's, he'll, he'll uh, It'll cure you with vitamins. Well, what happened was, and like I said earlier, in 2012, we sold for $45 million. And now every we had, we wind up getting seven buildings. We had 147 employees. We had a total continuum of care from inpatient to intensive outpatient to outpatient to aftercare. We had everything with people. People went to aftercare once a week if they were in town or on Skype at the time if they were out of town. So, and we had a lot of follow-up care with them. So this is what wound up happening, but to digress back, when I was younger and I was 20 when I got married, all right, to give you a little background about my family, uh, my uncle threw the wedding. And he's a great guy, but a little crazy. And uh, what had happened was the caterer insulted him in front of the family. Now, I married a Jewish girl, and the parents wanted me to be Jewish, but of course I was Italian. They met my family, they loved my family, which was funny. I mean, they were a great family, but you know. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so it wind up happening on one side of the room, there was lawyers, of course, uh, the, the, my wife at the time, her father was a lawyer, her mother was the head of the PTA, and they had doctors and lawyers and teachers and, you know, with pens. On the other side, we had drug dealers, racketeers, they were with guns. So it was kind of an interesting mix. So the caterer insulted my uncle. So the next morning, he killed him. Now, I have to leave town real quick because the, the police were coming to my grandmother's house. That's where we were. And we had to get to the airport four hours early because the police were going to arrest my uncle for killing the caterer. So if you want an interesting story, read my book. <laughs> and you'll see a lot of things. <laughs> wow. So the, the holistic treatment that you were giving your your patients or clients, did it work? Like what really worked well, for them and what really did it? What did. Okay, here's what we did. We did outcome studies, but we didn't do our own. Because if you do your own, people don't believe you because you can tweak it any way you want. So we hired an outside source, which was Dr. Ken Blum. Now, Dr. Blum was the geneticist who found the addiction gene, the alcoholic gene. There is an addiction gene. It's the main gene. It's called DRD2. 
ALE1 variant gene. Now, it's the main gene. There are other genes that are involved, and that's the main one. And just because you have that gene doesn't mean you're going to become an addict because there's such a thing as epigenetics. Now, epigenetics means that the social environment can change the gene expression. So they did the research, and we had about a 70% success rate for a year that we followed the clients. Now, first of all, when clients come into treatment, they're nutrient deficient and volume depleted, meaning they don't drink enough water, they eat garbage, okay, if they eat at all, all right? So their whole body's out of homeostasis. So of course their mind's gonna be out of homeostasis. And when your gut, your microbiome, your microbiota, the flora in your gut, which is when that's out of whack, okay, your brain gets out of whack. Why? Because 90, 60, 90% 90 of serotonin and dopamine, the feel good drug that we manufacture naturally, okay, is manufactured in your gut. It goes up the vagus nerve and deposits into your brain. So if you're genetically predisposed, you don't get enough serotonin and dopamine also. So you really got to exercise to get rid of stress. And when you exercise, you also increase dopamine. Eat properly. Okay, now what does that mean? Sugars and processed food and all the garbage that we eat. No good. It's causing cancer. It's causing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. All right? Probiotics, prebiotics for your, for your gut. Drinking at least three quarters of a gallon of water. Okay? Good water. Not the stuff they find in the bottle of water. There's certain kinds of water that you can get. See, my house, my whole house is, is filtrated. And my drinking water is reverse osmosis. And I also have a machine that does alkaline water. I don't expect everybody to have that. But you got to find water, okay, that's good water. And how do you do that? Look it up. I don't tout anybody's water. Just look it up and find where you can get good water. It's usually spring water is good water. Mm -hmm. Okay, because our water systems are really in bad shape. Um, meditation, very important to calm your mind. Go to therapy, right? Do some inner child work because most of us have a lot of baggage from our childhood. Deal with that, learn, because it, it colors the way you look at your life. And, you know, recovery is not just about drugs and alcohol and mental health issues. It's about life. Learn to live a quality life, not just life. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, I, and it's not about religion. It's about spirituality. Now, a lot of people say, what's spirituality? To me, spirituality is learn to be kind instead of right. Help people less fortunate than you. Do your best not to lie, cheat, or steal. These are the tenets of the way, don't hurt yourself for other people. Don't carry resentments and, and all of this stuff. It poisons your system. And don't try to change anybody. Think about how hard it is to change you. Simple stuff. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. said earlier that you, when you first tried to kneel, you had a hard time kneeling. Where? Why do you think that was? I don't know. Was it like I, you're I, sick of kneeling because of being Catholic? Or? Yeah, you know, listen, I mean, I was like, this is bullshit. You know, it's baloney, okay? Yeah. Here's the funny part, okay? The funny part was, I, I used to coach God in the meetings. And an old time that came up to me goes, oh, John, how about G-O-D? I said, listen, man, I know how to spell. He said, no, no, no. How about good orderly direction as your higher power? I said, you know what? I can do that. That was my God for about a couple of years. Today, oddly enough, 
I'm a chaplain for the North Miami Police Department. I went to, a, I was with this woman and we went to this church and this uh, uh, school, okay, for a religious school, a couple of years and I got ordained. And how that happened, I don't know. You know, they say in the beginning of the program of recovery that beyond your wildest dreams, here I am, kid from the South Bronx, raised by a crazy family, street kid. I was in gangs when I was a kid. All right, only went to the ninth grade. All the things that were against me, homeless. And here I am today, I lecture all over the world. I write books. I made millions of dollars. How in the world could that be? And what I found out was I'm doing God's work, helping God's kids. And it's not yeah. about money, mm -hmm. okay? It's about being able to pass it on. Yeah. Pay it forward, like you're doing. Yeah. You know? So it's a it's a high the highest calling is to be of service and when you are helping others it comes back to you in multitudes of ways so yeah i see it all the time so yeah yep yep and then the universe kind of aligns to support that because that's a very high calling to help others, to be of service to others or the planet or, you know, whatever your calling is. And then the universe kind of moves and shifts in ways to keep that going. No, people don't believe in this stuff. And I'll be honest with you, neither did I. All right. But when you start to look, I'm, I'm going to be 76 in August. When, you, when I start to look back on my life, I should have been dead a long time ago, number one. I mean, when you go into the book, I used to sell drugs. I used to do collection work for the smugglers. I used to go to Colombia and teach the cartels, bodyguards, martial arts. I mean, crazy stuff, all right? Here I am on this podcast with you talking about a, an entirely different approach to life. Mm -hmm. Or my friends were drug dealers, hitmen, robbers, all kinds of crazy people. Today, <laughs> doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, scientists, clinicians, researchers, it's crazy. Never in a million years would I have ever believed that. I think you turned your life around the moment you decided that you not only were gonna get sober, but you were gonna help other people get sober. I never did it for the money. Yeah. We never, we never, money wasn't our focus. Right. It's not. not it's I not when you have a calling. Yeah. What an angel that bought the seven buildings we had for us. One of the fathers of one of the clients was a multi multi man. And of course, we paid him back as you know, every month. But we just kept putting one foot in front of the other. What we used to go out in the neighborhood in the hood two, three in the morning, picking up clients out of crack houses. Crazy stuff we used to do. I mean, I remember we got a call at three in the morning and at one of my houses there that the clients were living in. And I get a call that there's two girls in the bathroom, all right, and they won't come out. Three o'clock in the morning, I got out of my house, run over there to the facility. I said, what's going on here? They won't get out and we're afraid that they're shooting up drugs. So I had a three quarter way house also. That's where clients live after treatment. Mm -hmm. So I kicked the door down. One girl, they both girls were naked. One girl was in the bathtub, okay, out of it. The other girl was purple. Her lips were purple, no color in her face. I drag her out. I give her CPR. I bring her back to life, literally. Meanwhile, they call 911. And she whispers in my ear and she cursed at me. And she says, why didn't you let me die? There's a moral to the story. Three years later, I get a phone call. It was that girl. And she says, I want to thank you for saving my life. 
my life has changed. You never know. Yeah. You know, you never know how things are going to wind up. So those of you that are out there that are suffering, there is hope. Okay, but hope doesn't come in on a, on a bird or parachute. You have to do the work. Now, there's, I, I came across a technology that's almost, I couldn't even believe it, to be honest with you. I, um, I'm still, a, 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 you know, a, you, you can take the kid out of the street, but you can't take the street out of the kid. So I, don't, I, I still don't trust things, okay? I do, but I don't. So I have this guy, a friend of mine, who's a lobbyist in Washington, and he says to me, John, this guy has this technique that he does. He's chiropractor. I said, look, some chiropractors are good, some are not too good. You know, I, you know, because you know, I had stenosis in my back. I used to get ablation. I used to get shots and all that because all the karate and the judo that I went through. My wife had back pains also. <clears throat> he says, no, no, no. He doesn't touch you with his hands. Uh, okay, now he's a magician. You're gonna tell me. He says, no, John. You gotta trust me. Just go there. I said, okay. So we go see this guy. So he does some exercises with us, sends us for x-rays of our neck. We get the x-rays, we bring back the CD. He does some calculations the next morning, he lays me on a table and I had one leg shorter than the other. All right, I used to limp also a little bit. And he puts these calculations into this computer in this machine and you hear a click. Nothing touches you, just a little bar goes right by your neck and you hear a click. Tells my wife, come to the end of the table, look at, look at my feet, they were even. I get off the table, I have no more pain. I said, what is this? My wife, the same thing. The next morning, I'm reading and my wife says, don't you need your glasses? I says, oh, oh shoot, no, I don't. I can see better. I said, this is weird. So we went back to the doctor. I said, what is this? He said, look, what, that, what he adjusted was called the atlas. The atlas is the bone on top of your vertebrae that holds up your head. It's a free floating bone. Now what runs through the atlas is your nerves. They go down your spinal column and into your major organs and your inner carotid artery, which takes the blood flow into your brain and then also takes the blood flow out, but also it bypasses your optic nerve. So in my particular case, my neck was so out of alignment by my um, atlas that it was pinching the blood flow to my brain, just like a hose would be crimped. Mm -hmm. And it was also pinching the nerves that were running down my spinal cord. By aligning it into the genetic predisposition, he took it away. It's now six months, zero pain. Now, let me tell you what that does. A lot of people that become addicted never started off being addicts. They were maybe in car accidents, sporting accidents, or whatever. They get on these oxycodone, oxycontin, all these opioids. Then they can't get off them. Then they want to get off them to become addicted. So they go to treatment. We get them off the drugs, send them home. They still have the pain. Mm -hmm. So what do you think happens? After a while, they go back on the drugs. Some of them die. Some of them wind up staying as addicts. So this is going to be a game changer for the addiction field. Yeah, what definitely. He does, what he does with this machine, he sends a pulse, which is a sound wave to the atlas at a certain angle. Okay, according to the x-ray. And it aligns it. You know, if you ever see sound waves hit water, it ripples. Mm -hmm. So it actually moves because the bone floats. It's not fixed. And he aligns it to your vertebrae. So when your vertebrae, when your this is out of alignment, your atlas, this tries to compensate. This could be uh, a bulging disc. This can cause the muscles to contract, fresh on the nerves and cause pain. Once this from here goes here, the body starts to compensate back again. 
don't believe a word I tell you. I always tell people that. Please don't. Yeah. Okay. Go to epicclinics.com. Dr. Stan Pierce. That's epicclinics.com. It's in Clearwater, Florida. I don't have any, I don't own anything yet because I'm interested in doing something with him. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's an incredible, I mean, it, I sent 15 people there, friends of mine. One guy who's 85, used to walk with a walker. I said, I put the word, used to. Doesn't walk with a walker anymore. Wow. What can I tell you guys? Okay. Friends of mine that can't believe it. They go, what is this? So I told you what it was. <laughs> That's amazing. I want to oh, go. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I, I'm not going to make a joke out of myself and send people, all right, and say how great it is. And they come back and say, oh, this is bullshit. Oh, you know, this is baloney. Okay? No, it's not baloney. I did it. Yeah. My wife did it. My friends did it. Mm -hmm. I sent my daughter, I sent my son. I mean, you know, I always tell people about nutrients and, and, and food and stuff. I said, look, man, please don't believe me. I don't want you to believe me. I want you to go investigate. Just like you want to get high, you'll investigate where's the best dealer in town or any dealer if you want to get high. Mm -hmm. So make like you're looking for a dealer. <laughs> do your research <laughs> right. and try it you know I always say people try it if you don't like it you won't ever have to do it again if... listen all I tell people is how's your way working yeah, yeah exactly exactly so you've got your books and you've been speaking and um Tell the audience where they can find your books and where they can contact you. Okay. It's, um, you can go to my website. Well, my books you can find everywhere. It's on Amazon. It's in Walmart. It's in Barnes & Noble. Um, you go to my website if you want to know more about me. It's John, the initial J, Giordano, G-I-O-R-D-A-N-O.com. John, J, Giordano.com. And... This is the book that I'm talking about. The kid from the South Bronx who never gave up. And I, I put a suit on with sunglasses because I was going to be homeless looking, but I said, no, this is about being successful, not being homeless again. So that's how I put the cover on. Being successful is finding your passion and helping others. So it's, it's all about finding your soul, the one that God of your understanding put there. Okay? The money's great. I'm not going to say it doesn't help, but it's not about the money. I know there's so many people that got millions of dollars, they're miserable. Yeah. Okay? It's about finding your purpose in life. It's about reaching out. We're all connected and interconnected. I don't care what color you are, if you're gay, if you're straight, who cares? Okay, you know, a lot of people, oh, this is, they're, they're this and they're that. Look, is God infallible, whatever God is to you? Well, did he make all of us? Well, how can this one be that good? And that means he's no good. Yeah. He's broke. He made a mistake. <laughs> God, he made a mistake. <laughs> nope, he did it. Well, thank you so much, Sean, for being on the show. That's pretty amazing life story. Um, when I think back on what you talked about, I feel like, you know, you took a lot of risks. And I think it's a good example of how if you don't take any risks, you're not going to have any big rewards. And, you know. No decision. Is a decision. Yes, definitely. I tell people that all the time. You know, people, I don't know what to do. I can't make a decision. Well, you already made a decision. Yep. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your story. Mm -hmm. Check out his books. And, uh, you know, I 
enjoyed talking with you today. And all the books are on there, How to Beat Your Addiction, Live a Quality of Life, all that stuff is there. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you.